Okay, let's go on. Let's let's hit into this. We have we're on to chapter five, Michael Mann's two frameworks of class analysis. I'll take the first little bit. This is the main thesis here. Does anybody know much about the Michael Mann? I don't really know much about him. Anybody know anything of him? Nah. No. Not another one of these sociology guys, I guess. I deeply suspect that Eric Olin Wright chose Michael Mann because it's a way of sort of secretly talking about one of the Leninist views of, of class. But it's also talking about, it's, it's not like I'm going to go read this, you know, Bordiga and I'm going to go argue with Bordiga. It's just someone that's, you know, making a similar version of one of those arguments in a contemporary sociology context. And specifically those arguments, what do you, what do you mean by the Leninist argument? So, so, um, Amadeo Bordiga in one, in one of the pieces he writes on party and class says something that is, I'm not sure if it, this is exactly the point of view that Lenin has, but only because I don't think Lenin would be so honest is that look, the class, like the actual, like, you know, sociological kind of like fact of the class is nothing. The class organization is the class, right? Like just this scattered morass of a bunch of people we're supposed to like help liberate in their like daily lives and who they are. That's nothing. But <laughs> their, you know, their combined capacities, that's the class. That's the real class. So basically you, you hear this kind of expressed online, like as like a, a class without like a political organization isn't really a class or often you'll hear like there is no proletariat that exists unless there is a class actor. Yeah. This plugs in well with the one party, one class paradigm that a lot of those Leninists are working with, you know, because to have that kind of organization, which they imagine is sort of a one-to-one -one map, you know, it means that you have something sociologically real. Especially the one-to-one -one correspondence is wrong, but even without that obviously wrong thing, in my view, it's obviously wrong in the United States and in many other places. But like dispensing with that part and just focusing on, you know, classes are what they can do. That's a more interesting conversation. And it happens to be a conversation with, I guess, uh, Someone that, you know, wrote a book that sociologists pay attention to, not just like, you know, extremely online internet nerds and communist grandpas. It's kind of the thing, like, I, I end up disagreeing a lot with Michael Mann, but this is like a way better version of what you hear dipshit Marxists talking about. I don't know, I'm really sympathetic at first to like the idea of, about how po important power is in organizational structures and the kind of four different types of power, which I guess we'll get into, but. Todd, yeah, I would also something? just say like, uh, you know, given what we read in revolutionary strategy, it's like that thing of, even if you have a single party representing a class prior to taking power, they'll just as a kind of a matter of course fragment once the the class beco like becomes hegemonic yeah it's just like well there's a there's a rationality to bandwagoning together but it doesn't mean that the class the interests of every section of the class are unitary right and oftentimes there's like just people who aren't represented at all in a party even if they do fragment yeah like and you know i would be more of the opinion that like you'll never get everybody into like say the proletariat into one organization that leads them, I think that it's literally there will always be sec sectors, and it's really a power battle within the proletariat itself for for dominance on, on some level. You know, the real world is very messy. It's not like you know we can just come up with this really good party organizational form and everybody will go into it. It will, it will undoubtedly be messy and have you know power battles. Yeah, and and even if even if your dominant faction of whatever organization wins out, after that, it'll probably split just like you're talking about. And McNair said. Yeah. And you can also see this in um, electoral systems with proportional representation, right? Because 
you'll tend to have like a greater split within a class in those systems because there's less of an incentive for bandwagoning. And then the coalitions that they form tend to be like the party in the Marxist sense of like the pre like, you know, S payday style of just sort of like a collective movement political actor that it has no like really strong institutional basis. Yeah, you get this agglomeration of all these small disparate parties, you know, or, yeah. or some major ones, but with them too. Like in like in Chile, just did I just released an episode there on Chile, and it's like you know the popular unity platform. It was like there was about seven or eight parties in the goddamn thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like in the Belgian. It was like a Belgian government coalition. <laughs> or a Dutch one. <laughs> or a Dutch one, yeah. You know, there's like nine F parties in the goddamn things. Ireland's not so bad because we have this very weird thing of we have what are called independents. So we have like these people who don't aren't even in a party and they run. And there's loads of them. There's like about a quarter or maybe in a sixth of the parliament is just made up of these people who just run on their own name, you know, because they're good at like getting, you know, potholes fixed or something. Yeah, it's very Yeah, that that's kind wow. of um, a phenomenon that you see in Japan's proportional representation system as well, is that you like you have people who, like politicians who have like a purely personal power base and they create like a kind of like fake ass party to just be their personal vehicle. And it's just like them and some other losers and they're the only ones who ever get elected or, or maybe they're just you know, their hangers on, but it's, it's really just like an entirely personalistic power base. I'm just looking here at the Irish one. There's 23 out of 180, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's like nearly 15%. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's kind of nothing like that. I guess there's some races where you can't join a party. And so those are technically like nonpartisan, but they're usually secretly partisan anyway. Like, well, well, yeah, there's some local races where we're told it's like a nonpartisan race, but these individuals are members and supported by either the Republican or Democratic Party, usually. It's just like you Bernie don't Sanders. see... No, not even. Like, the election itself isn't partisan. So right. you just have oh, a list right, yeah. of six candidates. You you don't know what party they're, they're with, but they're with a party. Yeah, with what you're describing, where someone creates basically like a shell party in their in the wake of their personal like influence is basically what you know Bernie did like vi- for like a very small window after he stopped mm-hmm. being mayor of Burlington and became a, a house representative but like <laughs> yeah it la- I think it, I don't know it didn't last that long like or or if from what I understand their independence was kind of already like not really a thing by that point. Like when when I hear about these independents in these countries, I'm like, oh yeah, independents, yeah. Like, and I just wonder, like, how do parties like try to interact with these independents? Do they like try to pressure them into well, uh, policies? Like in Ireland, what happens a lot of the times is that like there will be say a constituency, and there will be maybe five seats going to the going to the parliament from this one constituency. And so the major parties might have two or might run three people on a slate. And what happens sometimes is there's somebody who is in the party and for some internal party reasons, they lose their 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 ticket running for the party in the next election. And so what they do is they say, fuck you to the party. And then they run as an independent. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they will win, but they'll usually vote with their previous party. That's that's, I think, the majority of them. And then sometimes it's just single issue, like don't close our hospital candidates and things like that, you know. Okay, let's go into this. Anyway, the main thesis. There is a disjuncture between the general programmatic discussion of class and its theoretical framework and some of the empirical analyses in which he explores specific problems in class analyses. Man adopts a restrictive understanding of the explanatory relevance of class seeing class almost exclusively in terms of the ways in which organized collective actors are formed around economic power resources. This is getting to what Esri said there earlier. In this formulation, class is is only of of sociological interest to the extent that classes are constituted as collective actors. 
in the concrete empirical analysis, on the other hand, he often develops the concept of class in terms of the ways in which the location of individuals within market and work organizations shape their individual interests, experience, and capacities, i.e. more like a structural concept, identifying a set of causal forces that operate on the lives of individuals. Mann offers, does not offer theoretical argument for integrating these two conceptualizations. Okay, just that bit there, but can, can somebody talk to the, this difference between the structure and the power actor? and what he's getting at there. It's essentially like in the first conception, if you aren't a collective actor acting on a rational class interest, then you aren't socially real to him. But then when he goes and does the empirical analysis, people who do not belong or do not like manifest their class interest exclusively through rational deliberation on which collective actor to join and then the deliberation of the collective actor on how to behave are in the empirical analysis and they have like you know dimensions of their lives that are shaped by their class positions and class relations in a way that doesn't make any sense in that first framework like they can act in the world with respect to their class, but not through one of these power organizations as a class organization. Yeah, because you're talking about like, uh, you know, a, a, this structural conception of class, which is that like, you know, there's some kind of structuration process where an individual is given like a disposition towards class and that affects how they behave. And whether they're a member of a collective actor or not, that is like, you know, for itself has no real, there has no necessary connection to that. So, like, is there a reticence in these sociologists to talk about that leap from class in itself to class for itself? Um, I mean, probably they just don't want to use like Hegelian language, but they're totally talking about it. They're talking yeah. about it without talking about it. But he's, well, like, well, the Red's point criticism. here, Red's that point here is that man, man, it's like basically says that well, this whole cluster of stuff doesn't really matter for class. Only the the power stuff does. But as soon as you recognize someone's power, like organization, and how do you explain that? Well, then you go back to the stuff that he said that he's going to ignore. Like, right. Right. What like, he calls latent class when he does an actual empirical analysis of the middle class in the nineteenth century. All these relations, which man would dismiss as latent class, it's not sociologically real, are the reasons why collective actors form in the first place. So if it's not important, why does it make the thing that's important? Right. Who wants to take this one? Ezri, do you want to read this one? Yeah, I got it. So the raw materials of alternative approaches to class analysis... Most theoretical approaches to class analysis embody three clusters of interrelated concepts. Class relations, class location, and class structure. That's cluster one. Cluster two is class structuration and class formation. Cluster three is collective class actors. All three of these clusters constitute, quote, realist conceptions insofar as they attempt to identify real causal processes and their effects. While in principle, there is no inherent need to choose among them, in practice, class analysts tend to center their work on one or another of them. Okay. I, 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 must, I must admit I found it quite difficult to understand the difference between these. We, 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 I think we can just go to the first one, the class relations. Let's try the next one. Do you want to keep, keep going there, Esri? Yeah, I mean, when you have like that many that many things with class there's like you know six different you know it was it was dead ass just hard to read i was like yeah. wait so it's, there's three things but there's like seven terms here i had to read it like a lot yeah, yeah. and it's like class relations class structuration class like class structuration versus class structure 
you know, class formation class. I just find it, I find it like usually I think I find right very easy to read, you know, clear, mm -hmm. but I found this section, I must, I must admit, quite confusing. Same. I think I'm skipping class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, uh, this, is, this part was short, all right? Like, so, so for the first cluster, class relations, class locations, class structures. Class relations have different definitions. For Weberians, they emphasize the social relations of exchange in markets, locations within class relations, or what Weber calls class situations, are defined by the nature of the assets that people bring to the exchange relations. Marxists, on the other hand, define class relations in terms of a more encompassing idea of social relations of production, which include the relations of exchange in the labor market and the relations within production itself. Class location is a micro level concept. It enables us to identify a set of causal processes impinging on the lives of individuals. Class structure is a more macro level concept. It is defined by the set of class relations within any relevant unit of analysis. One can thus speak of the class structure of a firm, of a city, of an economic sector, of a society, etc. And then class relations is the cumulative common term for both micro, macro level concepts. Class locations are defined within class relations. Class structures are composed of sets of class relations. So okay. basically, I think it's helpful to think of this as like, you have this big, you have something inside of class relations, and then you have this big web of class relation, relations of class relations, basically. And if you think of a, a specific class relation, and you might have two people, two locations in that specific relation, and then you think about the relationship of that relation to other relations, well, that's the structure. Okay, let's break it down here. Like, let's talk about like, well, let, give us an example here of a class relation then. Alice works at Bob's factory. That's like, there's two um, locations there. There's the, you know, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? There's a bourgeois Bob and anarchy Alice. Like those are your locations, like the, the spaces that Bob and Alice occupy. Those are those micro little seats of class. You know, so that's, after, that's the class location versus yeah. the class relation. Is there, like, the, yeah. is is the is the relation between the bourgeoisie and the mm -hmm. the worker? But the class structure then is the relations between the bourgeoisie generally and the workers generally. Is that what class structure is saying versus class relations? Yeah, this is not yeah. So that, no, that's that's right. So how how does the relationship of Alice and Bob relate to? you know, the factory down the street that has position A for the worker and position B for, you know, the, the bourgeois, you know, bourgeois, right? Like, yeah, and there, there's sort of like meso level concepts of like, oh, mm -hmm. what is the class structure of this city, right? You could talk about that. It, it, you don't have to go from like, the individual to the maximal level of uh, structural abstraction. There's yeah, also right. like this, this firm city economic sector, that kind of stuff. It's any relation between relations in these, these economic terms. Like once there's a relation between two specific people, it's much more concrete than, all right, you know, you have the two factories or whatever, or they might, it might even be the same firm. You know, what's the relationship between, you know, Alice's employment at the firm and, you know, Kami Charlie's employment at the same firm or whatever. Like anytime, you know, it, it can be as small as comparing, you know, one person's relationship with the boss to another person's relationship with the boss. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I, I, it's just cleared in my head. Yeah. So like, because class relations is common to both. So it's like both at the small location and the higher mm -hmm. structure. Yeah. No, the, I, you know, in terms of clarity, this could have been rewritten because if you focus on class relation, and then you kind of zoom in and then scale out in a more deliberate way. I think I think it's not so bad that there's three words here, as long as you understand that it's relation is really what we're trying to understand. Right. Like, okay. I really could have used one of those fancy like figures that oh, Wright does yeah. sometimes for this. Yeah, totally. Like you know, have it kind of nested. Like you got the big 
structure and then underneath that you got the relations yeah. and then underneath that you got the locations that would have really helped me conceptualize this but 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 class relations are both in my in my, in, in the location and the structure as in their common yeah you could have done some kind of like umbrella you you, you could do it you could do some kind of figure like, yeah we want some uh, network some node some node analysis good then so then we're on to the second lot uh, do you want to take this one then, uh, Sophie? Sure. Class formation and structuration. Class relations and the locations they determine do not by themselves define a social group with any real identity or cohesion. People occupying a common location within class relations do share something important in common. They are subject to a common causal component of their life chances, favor, and this justifies treating them as a socialist relevant category. But they do not necessarily share a real collective existence. They're not necessarily a real social group with real social boundaries. The ramifications of class are stronger when classes become social groups in this stronger sense. What's interesting reading this, it, it kind of reminded me of like um like the early SPD and that like or like they're not just the early SPD, but like the like early German workers movement, and that they had like just a bunch of workers groups. Like I don't know, let's let's go bowling, let's go ride one of those ridiculous nineteenth century bicycles together, or whatever. Like they just had shit they did together that wasn't even necessarily political, and how that helped make a real social group with real social boundaries. And maybe that maybe that's why we need a communist bowling league. Uh, this was a big subject of enthusiasm as part of the uh, sort of neo kautskyist revival with McNair. People started reading this book, The Alternative Culture by Vernon Litke, both at the insistence of Jacobin Head, Bhaskar Sankara. Everyone should read these books. Nice to know we're uh, downstream of all that. Yeah, but like, even a broke clock is right, you know? We should go bowling. That's fine. I mean, we should go bowling. Bowling is bowling sucks. Let's be honest. You know. I thought you would love bowling. You love <coughs> drinking. It's, it's just drinking, and it's just drinking, and with, like it's with different shoes. Yeah, so you can throw up in your shoes, and it's fine. <laughs> hey, you give the throw up <laughs> shoes back. It's it's fine. It's hard not to get sick when you wear clown shoes and drink a bottle of whiskey. You know, but uh, no, yeah, I haven't had a drink. You, who drinks whiskey at the bowling alley, Tom? What the fuck? Uh, you know what? I haven't had a drink since I puked bile a few weeks ago. That's done me. Oh, oh god. god. Yeah, six weeks. I haven't had a drink in six or eight weeks. I don't know how long I'm going to pour one out for Tom. Pour <laughs> one out, I mean, coffee. Yeah. I have like 48 cans of beer sitting downstairs just staring at me as well. And I, every time I walk past them, I, I, I feel my stomach churn. Yeah. Man, what were you drinking? I don't even think I drank that much. Like, that's the thing. You oh, know. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, I say that, but I did have, like, eight or nine pints and, like, six or eight. Oh, Tom! But, like, <laughs> but, you know, it was over a long period of time and I had food and things. You know, I was surprised, yeah, yeah. you know. I, I don't drink anymore, really. You know, that's it. Like, so when I go out, I go mad. Okay, <laughs> define to me here what he means by structuration. So structuration is borrowing from Anthony Giddens, Sir Anthony Giddens, who was knighted for defeating the Marxist in sociological combat. Isn't he the guitarist from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers or whatever? <laughs> yeah, babe. Yeah. He's, he's, he's him. They knighted him. <laughs> <laughs> I never want to feel... Okay, um, so... He's yeah, the brilliant did. sociologist that the British <laughs> think to. Yeah. He hides his accent um, so well when he sings, you know? Like, yeah, he really sounds like he's from California. Yeah, he's, yeah he, both, he think... came up with he came up with both structuration and uh, Californication. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Singular genius, Anthony Giddens. So, Anthony Giddens did a bunch of stuff during the eighties, including uh, creating like a non-Marxist theory of history and all this kind of stuff that was, you know, sociologically of interest to Marxists, but also kind of like, fuck you, we don't need you, we don't need you to do all this cool stuff. So incorporating Giddens is, eh, I guess, part of Wright's intellectual omnivorousness and I would say maturity, but perhaps 
half listenership and the panel here might think of it as cowardice to incorporate the the con you know something from an you know the enemy sociologists but structuration includes i'm just going to read inter and intragenerational class mobility class patterns of marriage and friendship formation the degree of class homogeneity of the neighborhoods the class stratification of schooling in ways that reinforce class boundaries and the many other processes that render the commonalities of common class situations and locations salient to the people in those locations. So, I mean, on the one hand, we should really kind of shrug. Who could argue with that? If you're interested in our inter- understanding class, those things are clearly relevant. Part of why right Danes even separate these different clusters is that people will f- fixate and focus on specifically this to the exclusion of other things. So it's it's more about a, nearly a focus. These these are yeah. I suppose that's his general overall point, isn't it? Yeah, and like the thing is that by using this kind of like process concept of structuration that allows Giddens to do a non-Marxist theory of like economic social history, right? And uh, you know that that's that's sort of uh, pr- maybe <laughs> process metaphysic, rightfully smuggled into like sociology, I think has, you know, uh, explanatory value, if, even if we don't like where it comes from. Okay, do you want to keep going with this one then? Class formation and structuration. For some class analysts, the decisive problem in class analysis is the formation of classes as groups in this sense. Pierre Bourdieu regards classes that are not constituted as real groups as merely classes on paper suggesting by this metaphor that they are just nominal categories invented by the analyst. Bordeaux emphasizes the need to break with the intellectualist illusion that leads one to consider the theoretical class constructed by the sociologist as a real class, an effectively mobilized group. Paul Kingston goes even further, insisting that if classes are not formed into such bounded groups with high levels of internal homogeneity, then classes don't exist. He thus refers to the United States today as a classless society. I think because uh, Chomsky also does this, like the myth of the classless society. And Chomsky's, of course, what I'm trying to say is good about this and that the way that America presents itself is as the land of opportunity, uh, as equality of opportunity being more or less the end of social class. So this isn't, you know, this rings familiar for nauseating reasons for American readers. Right. In America, I can't remember who said it, but there's that old adage, you know, Marxism never took off in America because workers don't think of themselves as oppressed. They think of themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires, which may have been true in the good old heyday of American ingenuity. But now people see shit like that and just like jerk off motion, fuck off, like, I, you know, I don't even know how to speculate. I think people are just more cynical about shit. But also, like, the- well, it's not. Yeah, it's not like they're woke. They're they're not like <laughs> Marxists because they don't believe in like hustle culture or something. It's just like it's something that we're surrounded with now. That's like compared to with our daily lives, it's such obvious bullshit. Yeah, the hustle isn't about getting ahead in life. The hustle is about paying your bills and barely getting by. So, like. People who are proud about their hustle are like probably a grifter. And it's pretty obvious because the people who actually do hustle are still struggling. They're not like getting ahead. But there's also people that are, go- are grinding, but can't psychologically like handle the idea that they're never going to get out. Yeah, sure. Some people are, are fooling themselves more than they're trying to fool others. That's fair. It's kind of an understandable like reservoir of like hope for people and which is kind of one of the problems of class consciousness. There's this queer girl that this reminds me of. She's super gorgeous, but like when I started following her on Facebook, it was all this like hustle memes and shit like that. And I'm just like, you're being played. Like, yeah, but by whom? It's it's so diffuse. She's playing herself. Sort of. She has help. Like in in America though, as well, you did have this like kind of Europeans went over there and stole. Mm-hmm land yeah. and got an actual piece of land versus being you know a serf or a peasant with fuck all like you know there was 
a yeah. more distribution of resources at a particular time in its history. Yeah, yeah, within the white population, you know, for right. example, like for you know nuclear families, totally. Like there, there's a there is a sense in which if you're part of that in group, it was you know more fairly distributed than other in groups. I think radically more more distributed than say somewhere like Europe at the time as well. When you take over a different continent and displace all the people there, yes, that's right. what you can do. Like, <laughs> and you take like the slavery out of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> just ignore the yeah. slavery and the genocide. Well, Bye. that's why people are obsessed with like colonizing other planets because you know it's a fantasy about like, but what if we could just do that again? Kind of makes it feels a little different if the planet, if the universe appears dead and empty. You know, that's why they're going to bring robots so they can like basically just kill the robots. They will bring the robots with them, get them to run around, and then like shoot them and go. Yeah. <laughs> have have you gonna... seen how Elon treats Tesla workers? It's like literally the same playbook. It's like we're going to bring them over and they'll be indentured servants. And then when that doesn't work, we'll figure out some even more oppressive structure of of labor. This is just the plot to Red Faction video game where there's a communist mm -hmm. uprising on mars although to yeah, be fair like that does have a very long history in science fiction yeah it no does. no it was invented by the playstation developers of red faction i can't yeah. think of any any celebrated novelists that have done anything similar this reminds me also of uh that more recent game that was made by the same people who made new vegas outer worlds okay it's like neo-feudalism in in space but steampunk well, what was the, there was a TV program there a while ago. It's just finished. Sci-fi one. Expanse. Yeah, kind of similar yeah. kind of thing. Anyway, I guess I should eventually finish reading this. Yeah, right? keep going. He thus refers to the United States today as a classless society. Jan Pokuski and Malcolm Waters refer to such situations as classless inequality. It's like yeah. when we talk about, like, atomization of the proletariat, except they're like, oh, but that means there's no classes because people are atomized. The better, yeah, I think the better way to talk about this is is the kind of Chomskyan thing, as we mentioned earlier, that, like, to point out how this is actually terrible, you'd even have to believe that class is only a relevant social category when it's organized as a collective act actor to see that the proletariat act uh, lacking a collective actor is fucking horrible. Well, th there's just a lot of people that clearly would benefit from a redistribution of resources. And it's so intuitively obvious when, I don't know, if you live in a city and see glittering skyscrapers and people piled up in the street next to them sleeping, it's not like a, you know? <laughs> no, like, it doesn't take a lot for people yeah. to think, like, maybe they should get a just a little bit of that. Just a little bit, at least. Yeah, or maybe on, on a bad day, ah, this whole fucking thing should go to hell. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but fuck this. Something's clearly wrong. It, it, and it, this is something that's intuitive to the framers, a debate going all the way back to the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Something that really, as a as a young young egg, that really stuck with me is reading how the Federalists were against direct democracy because they knew it would lead to redistribution of resources. Yeah, class struggle. Right. Yeah, it's uh, the kind of the kind of inequality in the United States today. It would maybe too conspiratorial to think of it as engineered. It gives the framers too much power. But, like, the Federalist does lay the blueprint for dispersing class power so that you can, ha you can maintain a proletariat without having to face the proletariat. Disturbingly, it seems almost like the rest of the world, maybe because this is, you know, capital, this, maybe this is, like, capitalism's, like, one of their, like, most difficult forms to deal with or something, because it unfortunately this is a talking point of the, of the European far right, but a stopped clock and horseshoes here is that, you know, the American style of trying to disintegrate the proletariat in that way, that's a popular strategy that's has spread among the world bourgeoisie. <laughs> like, 
like not everyone can really pull it off because some places have you know too much too many roots or whatever or uh, I, I don't know why maybe they just can't politically you know outflank this or that one person involved in that uh, effort anthony giddens <laughs> yeah I, I would imagine he is how is he involved I don't ever want to. Oh, you use like the structuration theory to basically like argue that class doesn't mean anything anymore. And then uh, you uh, like break all the social differences down into such fine grain nuances that uh, it's like everything becomes a shade of gray. Mm, right. There's like a famous British philosopher guy, is it AJ Grayling, I think? And he makes this Sega argument. I had a, like a lib friend of mine saying, oh, yeah. Classes don't exist anymore. Working class doesn't exist, man. And if you really yeah. hit hit strength, if you really just think about it, you know, yeah. you're just like all people. I, I'm not Maybe. high enough to do that, and I never will be. Meeting people like that out in the wild is like infuriating. Anyway, the central idea here is that one can identify an indeterminate number of attributes as characterizing the social location of a person. And there's no reason to give special importance to any of them unless they are crystallized into real social groups. It is only this that establishes the realism of the hypothesized real causal process identified with class relations. That, that last sentence has broken my brain. What's it saying? Yeah, that's a direct quote, actually. If I'm to understand this properly, it's essentially that like the reality principle here is that this is a class and this is not a class like arbitrary individual attributes not a class collective actors that's a class those are real and the reality principle is you got to be this thing and not the other thing yeah it's it's an interesting sort of empiricism about like social actors or something or it's 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 weird like it's an appeal at once to empiricism, but also to like a collective actor, which I, I just don't associate collective, like the positing of collective actors with empiricism, but I guess that's a pretty high bar to clear, right? So if there's an obvious class actor in your life, you'll know about it. Then you get somebody like Bruno Latour, who'll be like, no, the collective actors are meaningless. It's only the arbitrary <laughs> attributes of individuals that are real. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It says here that the real causal processes, but for me, surely the real causal process is the process of jumping from <laughs> the individual to the class action. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that, like, that's a thing. And I think that's kind of Wright's whole point is that like these economic relations are what drives the formation of class actors in the first place. A thing that's important to you is cause of the thing that's not real to you. Yeah, but like I'm not necessarily like any kind of hard methodological individualist. I think there's plenty of things that can be understood in aggregate that you don't have to necessarily break down in order to observe and say anything meaningful about. However, if it is a social process, at some point there are individuals doing it, like and like thinking shit while doing it. You might not be able to map every little bit of that, but like, well, right? Like I don't agree <laughs> with methodological individualism, but like. I, I think some Marxists who are just like so, who just bristle so much at that, it's like, well, what do you think, who do you think makes up groups? Right. Yeah. What right. are, you're not being dialectical enough. Well, correct. So hunty. No, no, but real causal process here is like the, the thing that's driving me nuts is that like, you know, individuals and their motivations doing stuff, not real causal process. You know what I mean? Like big, like symbolic, like class actor wielding some sort of obvious interest. Although, you know, it's very sympathetic to this being a big causal thing in general. It just seems to be cutting off and maybe just bracketing off a lot of the interesting parts of social class. It does seem like in this environment that it's trying to necessarily take the teeth out of any idea of like proletarian class interests, like just to be a little like suspicious and you know just for, for a moment i think it's okay to put that hat on too yeah because i mean the main the main point of positing this for like a lot of these sociologists is to say oh we don't have that in america so what you're saying is that 
Bordigas and these conservative sociologists are basically the same. I didn't say that. I just said they both, I'm saying it. They just both like <laughs> to ignore the same thing as long as it doesn't take the right form. <laughs> I'm saying even it. Though, even if they go on about form and content or whatever, right? I'm I'm sorry, sweaty, but you uh you're you're conservative now. Get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> Who, yeah. who, who are you calling sweaty exactly here now? <laughs> the Bordegas in my head that I'm arguing against. Okay. okay. I thought yeah. you were calling Esri sweaty. I was like, that's not nice, Sophia. No, it's pretty temp. It's like, the, we have a nice AC. It's working. It's working. Although it is Arizona, so I was going, hmm, maybe it is. <laughs> Those mangroves. <laughs>